I think so. Okay. Okay. Do I have screen sharing uh, capacity? You should. Be able I'm to... gonna. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, go ahead and try real quick. Yeah. Okay. Um, share screen. And I got it. There, you go. there it is. All right. Hey, hey, you two look good. All right. I'll be back in a few minutes. You betcha. All right. Are we ready to just jump in and rock and roll? Yeah. All right. I know I've got a light over my head I shouldn't have on, but sorry, guys. Okay. So I'm super excited to introduce something that you guys may or may not be familiar with, which is fascia decompression. And I got to partner with this amazing woman, Deanna Hansen, who we met through an association that we are both part of, the Holistic Leadership Council. And she did a, like a demonstration for us in one of our retreats. And it was so amazing. And I thought, I've got to do this on animals. I just got to figure out how to do it. So I contacted her and she was so enthusiastic about wanting to do this program with me. So we spent six months working on how we were going to take this Tech, this technological advancement that she does doesn't require any tools for the animals. We just work with our hands. And we, for six months, worked on case after case and figuring it out. And so we're excited to present to you tonight what we have created. So without any further ado, I'm going to let Deanna Hansen introduce herself and her background and her story. Deanna, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Siegel. Um, and first of all, Dr. Siegel, absolute pleasure that you reached out to me to partner with me on this. In my uh, book, Unblock Your Body, the very last chapter, and I wrote this book a number of years ago, I wrote all about my pet program that I had yet to create. And I was waiting for that right veterinarian to approach me and Dr. Siegel did. And here we are now, and I'm so very thrilled to be able to share this with you. We literally just launched this program two weeks ago, and people are already having phenomenal results with this. So um, my story, I, I became an athletic therapist in Canada back in 1995, and I always focused on deep tissue work. And I had a really successful practice because I had really strong hands, and I could find that scar tissue and really work through that and break it up. Having said that, my own personal life was in complete disarray. I was 50 pounds overweight, struggling with anxiety, depression, chronic pain, constipation, you name it. I mean, it was just not good. Even though I was doing the work that I was trained to do, I was eating properly. I was doing the exercise programs that as an athletic therapist, I understood to do. And yet for some reason, the laws of weight loss didn't apply to me. And my whole body was just in absolute chaos. So I made some big changes at the age of 30. This was 24 years ago. As a result of those changes, though, I started having really severe anxiety attacks. And it was this one anxiety attack in particular that was the seed of everything to come. Because in that moment, I actually was frozen in fear. I, I for, for a moment, I thought I was going to die because I couldn't catch my breath. And for some reason, I intuitively dove my hand into my abdomen. And the first thing I encountered, pain, but the pain took me away from my crazy thinking. It brought me to the ground. I knew I was going to live another day. But what was also fascinating was as I was just intuitively working through this tissue with my fingers, I recognized that it felt marbled with what seemed to be scar tissue, even though I hadn't had any injury or surgery in this area. So suddenly I had all of these aha moments, like no wonder when I'm coming home from a five mile run dripping wet with sweat, my belly would still feel cold. So for the first evening or so, I spent about 30 to 45 minutes doing the work. And I felt first and foremost, really calm. Woke up the next day, a little tender in the area, but I went and I worked on my patients all day, came back and I was excited to get back in and just start working a little more just because I had felt so calm. So the second night I do similar work and after that 30, 45 minutes, I stood up, I felt taller and I went and I looked at myself in the mirror and I literally began to cry because my belly was flatter than it had looked in years. So this became my new nightly focus after I would work on patients all day, I came home and I would continue to explore intuitively in my own body. And then after about two weeks or so, my chronic low back pain that I'd had for years was going away. My depression was lifting. And at that point, I started working on my patients in a very different way. I started approaching their body as I had done mine. And very quickly, I started seeing some really incredible results, which caused me to attract other therapists to learn my technique. So that was, again, 24 years ago. And 
I focus in the fascia system, which actually took me a couple of years to even recognize what I was doing because I was just, again, intuitively exploring in my own tissue. And then it was one day when one of my clients said, you should be teaching this, that I really started to pay attention to what my hands were doing. And when we get a little further in the discussion, I'll dive into the whole topic on fascia and I'll share a little bit more at that time. So Dr. Siegel, why don't you come on out and share your amazing story with everyone? Thank you. Well, like all of us, there's always that moment in your life, that impetus that drives you in a different direction, and it makes you come out of whatever you thought your limitations were. So for me, of course, it involved a horse. So this is my youngest daughter and Lily LaCrue, who was one of our show horses. And these two were just absolutely adorable. They were the undefeated champions at the local regional, and they were working on their national titles. And then there was that one show where something went very, very wrong and Lily reared in the air. The number one cause of a rider being killed is a horse falling and crushing on them. So we had a 2000 pound horse and a 50 pound rider. And this is not a picture of Lily and Demi, but it, it's an example of what they were experiencing. And my daughter was never taught to just let go and bail, get off the horse and just get safe. So she was literally dangling from this horse's mouth. She's holding as hard as she can to not fall off. And in effect, she was pulling the horse over backwards and she would have been crushed. The horse had the presence of mind to actually squat on one hind leg and push herself as hard as she could to the opposite direction of where my daughter started to fall off. When Lily hit the ground, you could not see space between child and horse. The horse caught her breath and got back up, but my daughter wasn't moving. So as I jumped over the railing, running towards my daughter, truly not knowing what I was going to find, by the grace of God, she was fine. Her pride, and that was all that she hurt. So thank God she was okay. But back home, Lily was still having problems. And so we were working at trying to figure out what her problem was. So we had equine veterinarians come out and look at her, and nobody could figure it out. But here was the words that I got to hear. Dr. Siegel, we don't know what's exactly wrong with Lily, but we will tell you that A, she is not safe to ride. She'll never be shown again. And two, here are your choices. You can put her out to pasture or you could put her down. And it was those words that I think we've all experienced on one end of the spectrum or the other, either we're telling somebody or they're telling us or a loved one that there's nothing more that can be done. And I just found that to be totally unacceptable. And so I started looking outside of my allopathic training for solutions. Five months later, that little dynamic duo went on to win the United States Reserve Youth National Championship, which is the most prestigious horse show in the entire United States. And I tell this story, A, because it changed my life and it changed how I practice medicine, but also because it tells the story of how we should never allow somebody to define who we are, and what our life should look like. Because no one knows that. It, that's a God thing. And we should never allow somebody to dictate their belief system and their opinions on us. And Lily, by the way, is still alive and well in my backyard. So we have to have a little humor here. We've, Especially in our industry, we've exhausted all conventional measures. One last desperate option is to put you on an alternative natural medicine that has a 96% success rate. And I'm sure we all share that sentiment as we go on our alternative journey. I do want to remind everybody how old pets should live, because this is a belief system that many of my owners come in and they tell me their animals are 12 and 13 and 15 years old. And they think that is so old and they they're just so proud that they made it to that. They're, they're living half their life expectancy. Same thing with us. You know, we're, I think the average death rate for humans is 72 for males and 76 for females or something like that. And we think we're doing good when we really should be living over a hundred and up to 120 thriving, not surviving. This is Maggie. Oh, this was cream puff. She's 38 years in the world Guinness book of record, 38 years and three days. And she had another mate in the house that was 34 owned by a plumber in Texas. And she is overweight, you know, so I think that's kind of humorous, but he attributes their longevity to the fact that they did eat some wild things in the outside and he loved on them several hours a day. This is Maggie, world record holder. She actually had her record broken. Uh, she was 30 years young from Australia. 
her owner attributed her longevity to the fact that she worked on a dairy farm. So she did high intensity exercise every day, hormetic stressor number one. She did intermittent fasting on her home, on her own hormetic stressor number two. And she also had a lot of raw food because she lived on a dairy farm. So she ate placentas and raw milk. And this is the one that now holds the record. This is Bobby, who is now 31 years young and broke the record in this year. And uh, amazing, right? And then this is Echo. He's 22. I know that because he is my cat. And if you notice, his eyes are bright. His coat is nice and thick and shiny. And he's just got all of his mental clarity. And when we see cats typically over the age of 20, they have chronic renal disease. They've got liver disease. They're muscle wasted. And they're just looking terrible. They're like death on wheels. So now I'm going to go back to Deanna and she is going to talk about fascia. And I'm going to turn the screen sharing off because she's going to demonstrate some stuff on herself. So I get asked all the time, what in my view is fascia? And I do believe, I, I actually say fascia, I'm Canadian. <laughs> and I do believe I have a little bit of a different understanding because of my approach in this system. So I've spent over 60,000 hours working on my own body and, and clients over the last 30, 30 years. And what I've recognized is like skin to the body, fascia is the skin to the cell interconnecting the trillions of cells in the body. It creates both the stability and the mobility, as well as the communication system between all cells in the body. So the challenge that we have with fascia is we are under these influences of gravity, unconscious living, basically the external forces of life, as well as the internal forces of life from negative relationships and all of these things. So the goal of the fascia is we should be keeping every one of our trillions of cells in their rightful position. But over time, the fascia becomes manipulated and we literally wind down. We basically become shorter and wider, but we spiral down. And because the fascia is partly here to keep us upright, as we start tipping off balance, because we're dominant on one side, we've had injuries and surgeries that have accumulated affecting us, the fascia will literally, almost like spinning a web, grip and adhere to anything in its pathway, even bone, creating adhesions to create the stability of the structure. Now, unfortunately, these adhesions block blood and oxygen flow, flow to cells, as well as block the ability for the body to detoxify correctly. So the more adhesions that the body is riddled with, the less flow we have. There's three pillars to understanding how to keep cells in correct alignment through fascia decompression. So basically get gravity compresses the fascia. The process that we teach people is to decompress the fascia to bring the cells back to correct alignment. So the first pillar is all about creating the space in the body that time has taken away. Uh, Dr. Siegel, if you can just pull up that one slide with the Fibonacci sequence here. This is a, a really neat slide because it shows time as well as the spiral pattern in, in nature. So everything in nature is based on the Fibonacci sequence, that architecture of numbers, zero plus one equals one, one plus one is two, one plus two is three, and so on. It creates that spiral pattern. This is how the galaxies are, the Nautilus seashells, how the body forms, plants, even how the body ages. So as we start compressing, we literally wind down through this patterning of numbers. So we basically are moving through time and decreasing space. So the goal of this process is to put the space back into the body that time has taken away. And when we do that, we are very effective at pulling those cells back, melting through these adhesions. So the second pillar, and this will tie in the first pillar, is inflating the space. And this comes down to understanding proper diaphragmatic breathing. Dr. Siegel, if you can put me back on the screen, this is where I just want to show a little bit about the diaphragm. Yeah. So the first thing we need to do, of course, is create the space. That's melting through these adhesions. And adhesions will grip and adhere to bone with a force of up to 2,000 pounds per square inch. So if we've been sitting collapsed in front of our computers for 10, 20, 30 years in this com collapsed, compressed posture, we are literally magnetically sealed in this alignment. So through the process of decompressing fascia, we put pressure into the fascia over time. We can use our hands, the tools I use for people, they're the block buddy and the block baby. 
We lie on these. They're made of bone or bamboo because they're similar in density to bone. So when we're going through the process of lying on these tools over a period of time, we are literally increasing heat and blood flow into that area. Now, when we combine that with understanding proper diaphragmatic breathing, that's really where the magic comes in, where we really get this amazing opportunity to melt through the adhesions. So the diaphragm, I, I know we all know this here, but of course it's a plate of muscle at the base of the rib cage. When we inhale, it moves down. When we exhale, it lifts. When this muscle is working properly, it is creating a continual massage for everything in this area, heating this area. When we don't practice conscious breathing, this muscle becomes weak and the weight of everything above causes the rib cage and everything above to collapse into the core. So we literally compress and we displace tissue, we displace the organs, the secondary muscles end up doing the work for breathing because even if we're not conscious breathers, we're built to survive. So those secondary muscles are going to kick in those muscles of the upper chest. Now, pain, fear, and stress cause us to reactively hold the breath. So if you see a deer survive an attack, it shakes, it shakes out that negative energy. We as humans, we tend to freeze. If we have a traumatic event, we have an injury, even if we have repeated insults from a sibling, that can create this freeze response in the diaphragm because that's our reactive nature is to protect ourselves. But again, we're built to survive. So we're gonna start breathing through the secondary muscles. The reason this is a challenge and a problem for us is if we're taking those upper chest breaths, they tend to be shallow and we're not pulling the air deeply enough into the lungs to reach where the majority of the oxygen receptor sites are at the base of the lungs. So when we train proper diaphragmatic breathing, we can feed up the, we can feed the body up to six times the oxygen. That's a huge increase in oxygenation. And it really comes down to understanding how to breathe that way. But here's the other challenge for people just wanting to do breathing exercises. When we start from a collapsed rib cage, now we have this plate of muscle that is literally locked, almost like a frozen shoulder. So we'll be using a little bit of that diaphragm, but we're not gonna be using that full plate of muscle, even if we are practicing diaphragmatic breathing when we're starting from that space. And again, we're dealing with a 2000 pound per square inch force, but it's a magnetic seal. So through the process of lying on the tool, using your hands in the tissue, we teach you how to undo that seal. So if you had two magnets far enough apart, they don't have any attraction towards each other. Put them close enough together, they seal with the force. If you actually try to pull them apart, that's pretty much impossible, but we can shear them apart. So by understanding how to move through the layers of fascia as we instruct, when you combine that with proper diaphragmatic breathing, we're heating externally as well as internally because turning on that diaphragm is like the body's furnace. The muscles of the upper chest are like a space heater. So I live in a 30 story building. In the winter here in Winnipeg, it can be minus 35 Celsius. If my window breaks and I don't have an ability to heat myself, I'll actually die in here. So if I have a space heater in my apartment when it's cold, I can only heat one room, but you turn on the building's furnace, all 30 stories of all the spaces are heated. So this is the significant, well, one of the many significances of the diaphragm and using this muscle appropriately. In fact, in Eckhart Tolle's Power of Now, he has a wonderful chapter talking about the difference between the diaphragmatic breather and the chest breather. So does Stephen Cope and Yoga and the Quest for the True Self. The physiology is entirely different. Even the brain pattern changes when we breathe diaphragmatically. So those are the first two pillars of fascia decompression. And then the third pillar is the most challenging and even potentially the most important in that this is where we learn to pull the cells back from where they've migrated to through unconscious living back to correct alignment through understanding proper postural foundations. So we're like a building. We have proper um, foundations to support correct cell alignment. But if we're not aware of what those are, then we fall under those influences of gravity being dominant on one side. And then those cells start to migrate away from correct alignment. And the further they are from where they should be, the less we have connection to those cells, the less space there is. So when we're talking about easy transfer of oxygen and nutrients into the cell and then the removal of toxins away from the cell, if that cell itself has less space, now it has a, a compromised ability for optimal flow. So that leads to an acidic environment. It leads to uh, starvation of cells from oxygen. And of course, that's the most important nutrients, feeds the ATP, the 
energy of the cell. So this basic process really in a very simple way teaches you to release the adhesions in the fascia, put blood and oxygen flow into that newly created space, and then maintain the space with correct alignment as we teach people how to um, strengthen proper postural foundations. So Dr. Siegel, we have a couple of before and after photos. I just wanna give you some examples here of some of the work that we do with our programs. And these are all self-care programs. So this was Connie. She was our winner of our 90 day challenge where I took people through um, three full cycles of working the full body with this process. And it's fascinating because I mean, the first thing you can really see from the side view in particular is the difference in her size and shape. But it's so much more than that because when I look at a body, I'm always looking to the cause sites to the pain because we need to address the cause sites as fascia interconnects every cell in the body. If we're only working on the areas of pain, then we're actually missing what's pulling those cells out of alignment. So most importantly, because the diaphragm is in the center of the body, the calves and the feet and the forearms and the hands, these are the areas that are the furthest from the engine. So the fascia freezes to these spaces with that greatest seal. So for example, if I have a frozen shoulder and I go and I have my shoulder worked on, as soon as I start walking, what's going on in the lower body and those calves and feet is going to pull me back into that negative alignment that would have been very impactful in creating that frozen shoulder in the first place. So whenever we look at the body, we always want to address the limbs as the limbs are basically the levers of the body. I, I like referring to them as tent poles. If we let the limbs just be all wonky all over the place, then the tent itself doesn't have that nice taut structure. So similarly in the body, when we don't address proper alignment for the limbs, then the core of the body becomes manipulated. I work on a lot of people with scoliosis and it's the work on the limbs that helps us pull their body back to alignment so that we can create a correction to the curve in the spine. So she had for years real um, issues with her shoulder joints and she'd done physio and a whole bunch of things. Anyways, got her out of the pain, um, her digestive process um, improved significantly. And I just wanna talk a little bit about size and shape here because it's really significant. They did a study in 2014 proving that 84% of weight loss comes through proper exhalation. And this was so um, encouraging for me because before I started this journey where I was 50 pounds overweight, I was dieting, I was doing the workouts and the weight, the rules of weight loss didn't apply to my body. And I recognized very early on that I wasn't breathing properly. So if I'm not breathing properly, which I learned how to do um, in yoga, likely most people aren't. So this became a really important foundation for my work. And when we are using that diaphragm correctly and we're keeping everything heated, Again, we are keeping the cells properly fed and clean and we're, we're detoxified. So if you look at her in the before photos, she has that collapse of the rib cage in the core. She has a weakened diaphragm. So the rib cage and everything above is falling into that abdominal space. And that's what's causing the ballooning of the belly. As I take people through these challenges, I encourage them not to change anything else. Like don't change your diet. Don't change other exercise. Don't do anything else. We just want to see what this process of fascia decompression will do. So this was simply from going through this process of doing block therapy, um, which accompanies the creating, inflating and maintaining space in the body and the correction of those limbs. So she still has a little bit of way to go, but she made a ton of progress. And most importantly, in my view, her abdominal issues resolved. She had a ton of gut issues prior to this and was really struggling with bloating and um, pain and all these other things. And that made a big, huge difference for her. So then I have another set of photos and this was really, really exciting. This is Connie. So this was my 21 day head, neck and face program. She made these changes in only 21 days. And what I love about this, aside from the fact that she has now a lifted face, being able to see the shift in the shape of her skull. So as we age, of course, we, we compress. So those skull bones, they squeeze together and that takes away space for the brain. You can see in the before picture how that right eye, it's hanging the, the eyelid and all the tissue there and what's going on in her jaw. So in working simply the rib cage, neck, head, face, and scalp, this is the change that we made for her in 21 days. So that's really, really exciting. And uh, again, 
she listed all of the things that changed as a result, her headaches changed, her vision improved, things like that. Next slide. This is the last slide and then I'll, I'll uh, let Dr. Siegel carry on. This was really exciting though, because one of my clients, she's in New York and she does thermography. So she took this thermography image before a client started working with block therapy. And two months later, this was her after. And she had said, she's never seen such a change in the inflammation, the stagnant inflammation in that period of time. So for anybody that doesn't know, the red and the white is where the, the most chronic inflammation is settled in her body right around that diaphragmatic area. So as we've taught her, to open the rib cage, release those adhesions that have locked that cage in negative alignment, blocking the diaphragm from working. Now she has a diaphragm that's moving up and down. She's turned the body on that healing potential through diaphragmatic breathing. And she's made all of those changes in that inflammatory process. So Dr. Siegel, if you want to take it from here. That was amazing. And I hope everybody got as much out of that as I do. Every time I hear it, it makes me sit up and I'm breathing better. And I'm more <laughs> conscious of it. So before I get into how we applied the fascia decompression for our fur family, I wanted to remind everybody my six steps to health and healing, because we are not living in isolation. And even though what the fascia decompression and the block therapy does is absolutely amazing. When we add the other elements in, we can really improve what overall health we are trying to achieve. So step number one in my protocol is we got to stop doing the things that are causing dis-ease. And that includes for our animals, feeding them processed foods. So kibble and canned diets, we want to feed a raw diet instead of these, this processed food full of chemicals. And then we want to make sure that the water that they're drinking is a healthy structured water that's also filtered. We want to look at the home environment to make sure that we have minimized the amount of toxins in the environment from things that touch the animal skin, cleaning products, air fresheners, all of those items are very important to help mitigate EMF. The animals typically don't leave the household. And so they're exposed to this EMF all the time. Cats love to lay on our computers. A lot of people put the bedding where these animals sleep near the Wi-Fi routers, and that's really devastating to them. And the last piece in pollution are the ants in our brain. Those are the automatic negative thoughts. We all have the stinking thinking, but the importance of that is when we are having those stress thoughts, we're creating these negative neurotransmitters, and then our animals are in training to those negative emotions that we're setting off. And so they don't know why they're feeling fear, or anger, and frustration from us, but they just know there's something wrong. And so they'll start in training to that. Step number two is we have to supply all the essential nutrients that these animals need to do their job. And an essential nutrient are those nutrients that the body cannot make in sufficient quantities on its own. Well, we all know that the food that we're eating is grown on nutrient depleted soils. I literally live in a food forest that I have help to procure. And even then I can't know exactly what are the nutrients in my soil. So I still take supplements that are those essential nutrients to make sure my body has those essential nutrients. And then we work on healing the gut in animals, just like we do in people. Number four is detoxification of the six organs of elimination, the kidney, the colon, the liver, the lungs, the skin, and the lymphatics. And I really can now add fascia as part of the lymphatic and detoxification process. Number five is the mitochondria. We want to promote bi mitochondrial biogenesis and have healthier, happier mitochondria. And number six is clearing trapped emotions. And we do know that emotions live inside the fascia. They're trapped there. So as we were we are releasing this fascia and the lymphatics, we're also releasing a lot of trapped emotions. And in people more so than in animals, we can see that process happen. And a lot of people will have these emotional crises and in crying, then they don't even know why. So now we're going to show you how it looks in the fur world. So this is Moon. She came to me in 2011. I'm not sorry, she was born in 2011. She came to me when she was uh, eight years old and she had bladder cancer. So we were able to actually clear the bladder cancer in five weeks. That was great. She goes back home and then she has a episode where she got very dizzy 
and the owner wasn't sure what happened to her. And ultimately we diagnosed her with a syndrome in animals called idiopathic vestibular syndrome. And basically she was left with dizziness and a head tilt. We didn't know what was the underlying cause, but once the episode resolved, she retained this head tilt. She also had a lot of weakness in her rear legs, which was interesting because the weakness was there prior to the idiopathic vestibular syndrome. It was there when we were treating the cancer. So she just had this rear end weakness. When she would pee, her back legs would shake and she was very unstable in the rear end. So here she is. Uh, we have just done an ultrasound. So she does have some anesthetic on board. So part of her little wobbliness is the drugs, but you can see that her head literally is tilted to the right side down. And that's how she'd been for at least six months. So I presented this case to Deanna and, and we started working on her. One of the things that we had started to do was help her to walk to the left because with her head down to the right, she was favoring that side. So this is one of the things that Deanna had us work on. You wanna describe some of the other stuff that we were doing, Deanna? Yeah, we basically brought this program into five different techniques. The first one we call the grip and the grab. So just like on people where fascia gets sticky and adheres to everything, it does the same thing in the animals. So when we're looking at the animal, we can see where there might be folds, we can see on the fur pattern if there's spirals, because again, that Fibonacci sequence, when you can see even like a hair in your hair, if you have a cowlick, that's actually the fascia twisting and gripping onto bone in that spiral fashion. So we have all these elements when we're looking at animals with their fur and with their alignment to see where they're not balanced and symmetrical. So we did the grip and the grab anywhere where we could see stickiness of the fascia in the body. And it's fascinating because when you, and, and I think Dr. Siegel has a couple of videos where we're going to be showing this, but when you're actually like gripping the fur and you're drawing it away from the body, you can feel the sticky, the glueiness. And so the goal is that we want the fascia to be gliding anywhere that it's sticky. It's, it's sharing that there's adhesions and that's going to be blocking flow to the body. We also have one called spine release. So whether we're working on a two and a half pound dog or a 110 pound dog or anything in between, we have different techniques and approaches to really bring balance into the spine. So that compression and ballooning that happens in people will also happen in animals. And there's a great photo that Dr. Siegel will be sharing where we did one of the techniques on a larger dog with this. We have a technique where we release the joints from the body. Again, we want to have equal weight on the back legs and then the front arms. So typically what happens though, just like with people, there's a dominance. So if that left front shoulder or arm isn't putting as much weight on the body, the equal and opposite one is gonna have to counterbalance so that the animal can stay upright. So when we release the joints from the spine, we can bring balance and symmetry into the joints, which promotes that, lymph that lymphatic flow and overall detoxification and blood and oxygen flow to the cells. We also have one where we what, that we call the tail draw. You can see on the tail if it's going to be moving over to one direction or the other. It should really be right in the center. So we have a technique where we can bring balance into the back of the pelvis through working on the tail and then in the ears, which is one of the things that we did quite a bit here with Moon to help really bring that head back into that neutral alignment where we release the ears. Because again, like everything else, there's going to be one ear that's going to have wound and become stickier to the skull. So we want to release that to bring balance and symmetry. So we do all these different approaches, all for the same purpose, though, for melting those adhesions. And then animals are very good at integrating the work far faster than people, especially if you as the pet parent are approaching the pet from that place of calm. And we teach you that as part of our program, how to do proper diaphragmatic breathing. So we did a bunch of techniques on Moon, and then we got Moon to start integrating posturally the changes. And I think the next video shows what's happened. Yeah, so we we treated her for two weeks in the office, and then she went home. She lives about a uh, four and a half hour drive from me. So she typically comes up now about twice a year. We make sure she's still cancer free, and that's what she was here for. And because of my relationship with Deanna, I thought, well, you know, we've never been able to fix this idiopathic vestibular tilt in an animal before. So I was excited to try. And I want to point out that after we did our two weeks of work, then we taught the owner's caregiver 
how to do the work. So the rest of it was done at home. And I want you to pay attention to not only where this is at home after she's gotten better, look at her head and look at her gait and the strength with which she trots. And there's that straight head. Can we have a little round of applause, everybody? Come on guys, get excited. <laughs> All right. And here she is um, from the back view. And again, you can just see she is vibrant with the way she moves. So needless to say, mommy was very happy with her. This was a case that came to us with a swollen foot on an emergency. And this was the day that the foot had swollen, according to the owner. They weren't sure what happened, but then after some investigation, they said, well, we did put a bandage on the foot, and but it wasn't very tight. So I'm thinking snake bite, insect bite, but the foot is really swollen. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's this oozing of serum coming from between the toes from the degree of swelling. So that was onset. This was two days later. Now at this point, we can actually see the demarcation line where they had to put a rubber band on the leg to hold the bandage on. And it had gone 360 around the foot and restricted all of the circulation and created a scar. And then this was one week from presentation. The skin is literally peeled off. There's no skin there anymore. That was the white, which was fibrin coming off and the toes were super swollen. And what we were doing for her this entire week, even before we knew what had happened, we were doing lymphatic therapy. We were doing vibration work. We were doing ozone and laser. And if it wasn't for all of that, she probably would have lost her foot. This was now a couple more days later on the left where we can see that the amount of necrosis has stopped. Uh, five more days later, we're starting to see granulation tissue. And then we start to see the healing process. And here she is uh, with a fully healed foot. Now I'm still working on the scar tissue here because if she's given an opportunity, that scar must still itch and she doesn't have great circulation, even though the foot is back to normal. And she was weight bearing and acting normal within four days of presentation but she was still sloughing her foot. It was pretty remarkable. This is Copper. He is one of our recent cases, came to us because he'd had a mass removed prior to coming to me about a year and a half earlier. And the owner described the process as a nightmare. The surgery was a nightmare. The recovery was a nightmare. And they said it wasn't a malignant tumor. And so she was very reluctant when he started growing another tumor to intervene surgically. So he came to us and we were doing a lot of detoxing. We had found out what his deficiencies and toxicities were. So he was having the remedies to fix that. And then his quality of life really started to crash and he wasn't able to walk very well. He was in a lot of discomfort. His osteoarthritis was becoming an issue. And the owner, the last couple of days before we decided to do the surgery was having to carry him in and out of the hotel where she was staying. So we decided that if we didn't take the mass off, then his quality of life would indicate the need for euthanasia. And so even though she was so nervous about doing the surgery, and his survival through the surgery, it was our last ditch effort. So we went in surgically, it was 4.64 pounds of a tumor that we removed. And to orientate you on the picture on the right, his head is to your right underneath, that's his chest and head aiming to the right. And that's his penis in the center. The tumor was taken off of his left hind leg, which is the lower leg. And then his other leg is up and over to the side. So we were able to get a beautiful closure on that. And here he is post-op the first day. And I'm gonna let Deanna describe the ballooning in his body. So remember the tumor was on the left side, Deanna. Yeah, so you can really see in that rib cage how that cage extends laterally to the left and then how that right hip in turn is counterbalancing what's going on through here. And so there's there's always this compression and ballooning and it's in the spiral, in the compression where things tend to grow. So that was where that tumor was growing, where everything was compressed and trapped as he was bearing more weight on that right hip. And then he had, again, that ballooning in the um, left rib cage. And then Dr. Siegel, uh, you did the, or, or you, you taught the pet parent to do the spine release 
for a dog this size. And I believe it was only one treatment or show me, show me the next one. The next right. slide. This is very nice. We see that he's ballooning on his left rib cage, very sunken in on the right. Okay, so there's the grip and grab that we were doing on him also. And some of the different moves. You can see how much movement I have up in here. We've already worked on this area. And back here where it's all chaotic, I can barely lift it. That's as high as I could go. So you can see I'm barely getting off the ground as opposed to here, I've got so much more space. So that's what Deanna was talking about when she was saying how when you go to grip it, it's really sticky. This is him one day later. I guess I don't need to say anything about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just, it's so exciting because it's, th these techniques aren't hard to do at all. They're, they're actually quite simple. It just takes a little bit of understanding of what your pet likes and will allow, and also the size of your pet and what you're able to do physically. So we show so many different options and it was with my sister's 110 pound dog, where we really started working with this spine release. And so we would have the parent standing with the legs, the knees moving into where that bulging was. And then you grab the dog on both sides and you wrap it around and then you hold for up to three minutes if you can, which can be a little bit of a workout. But if you can maintain that, it's so fast in creating that alignment shift, as you can see in just one day. So now we're going to see him walking. And on the left hand side, Dan is going to describe his gait and how he uses his head. We did it in slow-mo so that people could really appreciate what was happening. And as he gets closer, I'm gonna let Deanna do most of the talking, but pay attention to his left hind leg where we took the mask off. He's not actually using it. He's still knuckling and uh, Deanna, go ahead. Yeah, you can really see that left leg there. It's, it's getting basically through momentum pulled around instead of that hip flexor lifting that leg up and pulling it. And then every time he would do that, the, the head would bob down. So again, just showing this imbalance in the gait. And then that was on the 29th. So now we're literally two days post op. And then on the right is two more days later. So we're about four to four and a half days post op. And look at those legs move, especially his left hind leg. And the head isn't bobbing as much because he's much more balanced and he's actually able to bend the knee and use the leg. And that's what's so exciting with working on animals, which of course, until I really connected with Dr. Siegel, I always worked with people. And to see how quickly compared to people that animals integrate, it's like there's no ego getting in the way. They just, they, they take it, they use it and, and their bodies are different. So it's, it was so fascinating and just mind blowing truly how quickly change was happening. So she was staying at a hotel while she was down here. And she said that the people the day that he came in for surgery and she carried him, they were all thinking she was going to put him to sleep. And then three days later, they're looking and they're saying that is not even the same dog. They just couldn't believe how good he was doing. And then this little Ellie, uh, Ellie came to us because she had become suddenly paralyzed. Her owner took her to their veterinarian and the veterinarian sent her to a referral center for surgery. But when they did a pre-op blood work, her platelet count was really low. So she was not a surgical candidate. They didn't have anything else to offer. So they literally just left the Foley catheter in her bladder so she could pee and empty her bladder. And then they sent the lady home with nothing to do. So she ended up finding me. And the first video, in the, which is going to be the middle, is after I've done the first treatment on her. Now, when we started, she couldn't lift up at all. She was literally just dragging her rear end. And so we have just done the first treatment. I've done a chiropractic adjustment. I did some Eastam acupuncture, which you see on the left. And then I had done the fascia decompression. This is her going home on day two. We treated her every day. So she's a little wonky, but she's physically able to lift her back end off the ground. And when she's not too excited, she's able to place her feet. That's 48 hours. Here she is a couple of days later. And again, her gait is really off. Like she's got this hypermetric 
unconnected gate, but she is up and walking. Dana, you want to comment on her? Yeah, you can again just see the 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 curling of the spine to the left, how that whole left pelvis, because that right leg isn't working properly, how it wings over. And then you'll see again, like the next day, how much more integrated those back legs are when, when she's walking. Now, this was a dog that the veterinarian and the orthopedic surgeon said would never walk. And this is under five days. And each day she got better and better until she had virtually a normal gait. Uh, she would only lose her rear end here when she got going too fast. <laughs> Other than that, she was able to place. And then within another week, she had a 99% normal gait. All right, this is our last case for now. This is Cooper, five and a half month old male Bernadoodle. The owner had him in a harness strapped into the car, but somehow the leash was a little too long and he was able to jump out the window and kind of hung himself. So she immediately went to a veterinarian that was local. They said he had broken his neck because he couldn't use any of his feet. They hospitalized him, had him on steroids for a few days, and then he was able to regain function of everything except his left front leg. So they told the owner she needed to amputate the leg and she wasn't at all willing to do that. So she came to me. So this is how he presented. And he has no use of the left front leg. He just drags it and uses the momentum of his body to drag it along. Deanna, some comments? Uh, I mean, it, it's pretty self-explanatory here. Like you can really just see how he's having to adapt in order to get going. But that leg has virtually no stability or support, no integration at all. So we started doing the fascia decompression work. And he, in, in addition to that, which the owner was doing at home, we were doing hyperbaric oxygen every day, ozone. We were doing infrared light into his brachial plexus, because I think that's what he did. I didn't see any evidence of a neck fracture on the x-rays, but I did see brachial avulsions before. So that whole plexus got really damaged in the hanging incident. Chiropractic work, changed him to a raw diet, got him all in the nutrition that he needed. And this is a video that the owner took three oh, days later. Good boy. So You're trying to move it. That's a good boy, Paul. So he literally was able to move his shoulder okay. forward. And when she showed this to her regular veterinarian, he said, yeah, he's never going to walk. You just still need to amputate it. And we all just shook our head. So we started with the Fibonacci code. We're going to end with the Fibonacci code. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I hope you all enjoyed it. We are obviously very passionate about the work that we do. Deanna's work in humans is absolutely remarkable. And I want to point out that what we've created are programs for people to do at home. This is a self-healing program. The program that Deanna has for humans is a program where they learn how to do it themselves and maintain themselves with coaching, of course. And then the program for the pets, we also have set that up to where it's the owner actually doing the work and then we're guiding them and coaching them. So if anybody's interested in either doing the course or learning more about it, these are the links. Deanna's going to put them into the chat so you can just click on the hyperlink. So the first one is to the fascia decompression for your fur family. The second one is a sampler program that Deanna's giving as a gift to you guys. You want to describe that, Deanna? Yeah, so it's a nine-day guided video program using a rolled up towel, which is really effective. So in my actual starter program, again, we use the block buddy and the block baby. So it took me a couple of years to actually develop the actual size and shape for these tools. What's really important to note is the rounded edges here, because we are teaching you how to drive through the layers of fascia to get to the root of the issue, which is at the bone. So if you're doing something like, um, a, a roller, a fascia roller, and you're rolling on the surface, you're really only heating up those surface layers. You're, it's like you're, you're taking a boat and you're riding on the ocean. We go deep sea diving because again, it's at the root, of, it's at the bone where the real root of the issue is. So in order to be able to melt through those layers, we stay in position for a minimum of three minutes while we connect again to proper diaphragmatic breathing to create that heating externally and internally. And it's very effective at doing that. So the sampler program is 
teaching you again how to use a rolled up towel and the very first two classes we get right into proper diaphragmatic breathing and then those lower ribs to release that negative pattern that holding pattern that has put the diaphragm in that locked alignment and people feel the changes almost immediately so we cover the full body and we also teach you proper postural alignment in that program as well so that's a free gift for all of you so you can dive right in tonight and start if you want to give it a try and I've done both. I did the sampler program. That's where I got started and saw amazing changes. And then I got the starter program and I do block every day. So I highly recommend it. And then the last link is to my course, which is transformingvetmedicine.com. It takes you to the empowered pet parent course for those pet parents who want to take a deeper dive. And, you know, even though you guys are so educated on the human side, there are some nuances that are different for our fur babies. And so I encourage you, if you really want to understand the bioregulatory medicine of pets, the course is a good, it's a wonderful deep dive into that. And then of course I would be more than honored to help you guys implement the recommendations in the course. It's a three hour course, so it is quite long, but the first link is a free module if you would like to go there. So I think we have covered everything except for our ending quotes. The difference between a master and a beginner is that the master has failed more times than the beginner has ever tried. And I equate all of us in this area as being masters because we're all willing to take those risks and try new things and invent the path that no one has invented yet. If you can't, you must. And if you must, you can. Number one reason for failure is just simply a lack of resourcefulness. So thank you very much. There we are. Great. Hey, the, uh, the first two links, only one link worked. I don't know if you guys know that yet. Or hey, can you put them into the um in, into the chat? And then we do have one question from David Son. He showed up late and okay. he believes in the power of facial works and it's amazing to see what you do. Will you demonstrate or walk through how you do the facial decompression during the lecture? Well, my cat's sitting right here. <laughs> so how about that? Okay, let's aim it at little echo right here. I mean, I'll just hold it. Okay, so can y'all see him? So the yep. first place that I like to start is right here at the back of the neck. And it's really a nice calming spot. I'm doing one hand only because I'm holding the camera with the other. But what I am doing is I'm gripping and lifting just gently. You know, he got up because he was not sure what I'm doing, but I'm just holding that. And this is the area that typically mama dog or mama cat would be holding their young as she carried them around. So intuitively, this is a calming spot for them, but it's also about the fascia. Now he's going to leave me, but um, that that is the first thing I'm going to try to get back here and just lift that skin up. Now, keep in mind, I've worked on him before, so I don't know if you could appreciate how high my hand is and he's done. So, <laughs> but that's our grip and grab. There is a free sampler program for the fascia decompression course. And maybe that's the link that didn't work. Oh, let's, let's explain that as well. So, and, and that's free for anybody. So um, we, we teach you first of all, proper diaphragmatic breathing using a rolled up towel where I'm um, having Marlene or Dr. Siegel demonstrate. And then we teach the grip and grab on four different size dogs in that and we are always starting at the back of the neck because when we're looking at how the collapse of the rib cage is, the tissue gets drawn to that shoulder area and then it gets really tightly pulled on the hip area. So when we grab that tissue right at the back of the neck, there's an ease of a drawing away. But again, we can also create a release to improve proper breathing for the pet that in turn, you know, just improves everything like it does in people. And then as we continue to work down the body, we're lifting and we're holding. And if you can hold for up to as long as three minutes, that's amazing, but you don't have to hold as long. And what's lovely with working on the animals is you can do a little bit every day. So when Dr. Siegel and I were creating the actual program, uh, Dr. Siegel came to Winnipeg at the end of May and we worked on five different animals. Two of them we worked on three days in a row. And then the other three we worked on just once, but we spent about 30 to 50 minutes on each animal per session 
And we did a before video to show the alignment, the asymmetries, what was going on in their fascia pattern. Then we took them through a protocol and we called them creative pet, pet uh, protocols because of course we have to adapt what we are going to do based on what the pet is going to allow. And the largest one was a 110 pound German shepherd, which happened to be my sister's dog, which uh, who was 12 years old and not very compliant for the first two days. So that's uh, quite, quite the funny um, variation of videos, but, you know, working around what the animal will allow you to do and what it won't. And then by the third day, Riley was totally compliant and we were able to just do whatever he wanted. So that was great. But we really do show you a nice full range of working on different size from a two and a half pound, a 20, a 50, an 80 and 110 pound dog. And then through video demonstration, we have Dr. Siegel working on a cat um, so that we can show the same technique. Now, this technique also works on horses. Um, I have one of my teachers who's from Germany. She applied fascia decompression to her horse and made all the changes uh, there. So it doesn't matter what animal you're working on. It really just comes down to understanding the actual techniques and creating that release. And the real difference is instead of rubbing we're never rubbing on the surface, just like doing block therapy on the actual body. We're laying in position and we're very slowly moving through the layers of fascia, but we're not moving on the surface of the tool. So for example, if we're working to release the shoulder joint from the body, we put the hand in, we feel where those adhesions are and we hold and we hold for as long as that pet will allow. And we can slowly manipulate the arm, if it's the shoulder, the leg, if it's the hip, and just, we can, you can feel those threads of fascia, those elastic bands, that tension softening. And it's all about getting that blood and oxygen in there. And you can really sense it happening very quickly under your fingertips. And then very quickly, you have an increased range of motion in the joints. So just as an example of some of the techniques, but the spine release is really fun and simple too, especially with a little dog where you're literally just holding the rib cage and lifting the dog and allowing gravity and pressure over time to create a release of those adhesions in the vertebrae. And it's it's amazing how quickly, again, um, things change with this work. Can I ask real quick, what's the difference between osteopathic manipulation, chiropractic, and what you're doing? Uh, well, I mean, I've had many chiropractic adjustments and we're working with the actual adhesions in the layers of fascia with fascia decompression. So um, the only chiropractic adjustments I've ever had have been the actual, um, you know, the, the manual adjustments. So very different than that, because that's working on the, the skeletal system where we're working through those layers um, on a cellular level. Um, I actually have not had osteopathic treatments to be able to give you a best answer for that though. Actually, I think you've, you've described it quite quite nicely with what you're doing. It sounds a lot like osteopathic manipulation. So mm, um, exactly, John. John, you're you're the expert on that. You there? I see you there. Anyway, see the name. So <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, Jorge, Jorge put another link in there. If any the of link, the sampler program and the um, starter program, the links, there's no link for those two. If anybody just a uh, private messages me, I'll make sure they get the proper link. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And on a personal note, um, I had a 16 year old border collie named Shetty, short for Machete. I'm a Marine. And he was Dr. Clearfield's uh, mascot here at our office. And last year I had to put him down. He was 16 years old. And I think he had exactly what you guys just described. And the guilt has been huge because I asked Dr. Clearfield, what should I do? And he's like, I'd give it, you know, 24 to 48 hours. And I was like, man, he's been living for 16 years, doc. It's just time. It's just time. And I don't think we have nobody of either of you two caliber here in Reno, Nevada. So this was a powerful class. I realized I did what was right. I don't think nobody here would have known what to do. We would have played the pills and the injections and the emergency room and the whole thing. And I just want to thank both of you for what you're doing. And uh, I look forward to making my next Border Collie uh, Blue Healer service dog to live to 30 
plus years. It's a goal. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, that what you said is extremely powerful because several of the dogs that we worked on when we were doing the the taping of the course, right. the people said to us, oh, there's nothing wrong with our dog. And Deanna and I <laughs> look at these animals and there were structural problems. There was behavioral problems. There was a lot going on every single one of them. And they were all eating processed foods. And so, you know, we are, we there's never been a pet owner that, consciously and willingly harms their pet. They may do it to themselves, but they never do it to their pets. So it's really, it's a lack of knowledge. It's a change in belief systems. It's helping people to get an awareness. And, and my passion is to get out to millions and billions of people that are pet owners so that they learn what they could be doing. So I don't hear people like yourself telling me that pain and the guilt of not having an alternative, not understanding what they could do differently. Because there really is so much that we can do. And the beauty of the foster decompression for your fur family is that pet owners are empowered to be able to do things for their pet at home and touch them in a way that is so impactful that they're, they're kind of there anyway. You're already touching your animal. What if you were able to improve their health by just affecting just fosh and, de and uh, detoxification. And then if they piggyback that onto our pet parent course, where they really start to learn about deficiencies and toxicities and how to maintain the health of this individual pet. Oh my gosh, it just takes on a whole new meaning. And I just, you know, I just thought about this. Um, as a suicide specialist for veterans, I'm working with a whole lot of modalities going on right now, but there's a lot of veteran organizations that I know about that deal with these service dogs and service dogs, as you know, is it's, you might as well just say it's controversial. It's pretty bad, but a lot of veterans really need them like bad. They don't know about your stuff. And so I don't know how we can connect or contribute or figure this out, but it'd be nice if we can get you to a couple of, there's, there's probably, you know, top five dog organizations that are trying to get these pets to the veterans and, and to first, second, third responders. So maybe there's a way we can connect and figure out how to, you know, fix some of this stuff. Absolutely. It's knowledge, just knowledge is power. And it's interesting because one of the biggest pushbacks I get from people when it comes to diet and digestion is they go, oh, it's going to be so expensive but they've never calculated in broke care, <laughs> you know? So it's like we're conditioned to spend the money at the doctor and we don't even add that into the equation. And yet, if you could take that money and put it into prevention and have an animal that's thriving or for ourselves the same way, like you won't, <laughs> if I open my cabinets and my refrigerator door, it's just covered in supplements and I take them all, not all at the same time. But I don't, I'm 66 and I have zero health challenges. Deanna graced me with some work on my belly and, <laughs> and that was amazing. But, you know, I, I don't have any ailments, thank God. And at 66, I haven't seen a human doctor since the birth of my last child. So, you know, it, there's something to be said for learning how to care for ourselves. I eat out of my garden. I exercise every day. I do breath work properly. You know, that doesn't mean that I live a pristine life. I'm exposed to everything that everybody else is. I, I get those stinking thoughts and then I have to change them into a blessing. <laughs> and so the difference I think is that we choose what we want to have our life look like. And there are a lot of people that have stayed at my house and they go, oh my gosh, I could not live like you. And, and that's okay. You know, it's not for everybody, but it's what you choose, right? If I'm going to live to be old, I want to be vibrant and thriving as I get old. I don't want to be decrepit and full of a medicine cabinet of pills and ills and that kind of stuff. That's just me. Agree. I completely agree. If, if I may add, I think, I think one of the differences too today is um, I, I did a podcast with somebody where they shared that since the fifties, we now have about 144,000 more toxins that we are subjected to every single moment of the day. So we've become stickier. 
So I think a lot of those different techniques in the past that might have been more effective are less effective now because our net is way dirtier. And so we need something a little bit more intentional to actually work through that and to clean out the closet, so to speak, so that we can create that space to bring the life back into the body. And because we were also flogged with distraction, whether it be through the phone or the computer or video games, the posture that we end up adhering to. I, I look at the youth today and they are in such a different place. I'm 54. So when I was a kid and, and like many of us here, we probably didn't grow up in front of computers where today, you know, the, the young ones today and even the mothers of today, they grew up in front of technology. So I'm seeing such a difference in the kids coming out where we would have been born breathing diaphragmatically. And then over time, pain, fear, and stress cause us to reactively hold the breath where today I'm working with a lot of little ones that aren't breathing diaphragmatically from the get-go. And that's really changing the direction that the youth is taking with their health long-term. So um, to be able to really teach them how to understand the fascia and really br uh, bring it down to such a simple understanding that it's all about adhesion. You know, like they always mention that chronic inflammation is the root of, of disease where I don't see it that way at all. I see the adhesion in the scar tissue is really the root of disease because that creates the inflammation. And as long as the inflammation can get to an area, we can have a very different healing response. We deal with um, fractures and with tissue um, injury in a very different way. We're healing them in, you know, six to 10 days, as opposed to the typical time through addressing the inflammation and supporting it as opposed to stopping it in the moment. The second law of thermodynamics is nature abhors a gradient. So if there's a gap in the system, nature's going to fill it in, whether it's a gap in the bone, a gap in a tendon, a muscle, a ligament, whatever it happens to be, inflammation is sent. And if we stop that, it's like we're basically taking batter and putting it in the freezer instead of putting the batter in the oven to bake the cake. We need to assist the inflammation through heating, through adding energy, through teaching people how to properly breathe. As soon as we ice it, that gap is going to get filled in, but the netting, the of the container of all the cells ends up getting sucked into that space created as in a vortex in that spiral, that Fibonacci sequence, creating a shifting of the entire alignment of the body. So if we can even approach acute injury differently, we can change the way we heal the body and bring it back to that balance that it was in the first place, instead of becoming riddled with scar tissue and having these memories stored and stuck in the fascia system lifelong. And then of course, that emotional trauma also gets stuck and stored in the fascia. So that ends up getting released as we start unlocking these fascial patterns in the body and bringing life back into those spaces. You keep saying adhesions, and I know what that means, but what does it mean in response to fascial decompression? So like um, if you were to have uh, a burn on your skin. I, I actually had a slide that I was going to share here and then I, I chose not to just so I could explain things a little differently. But if you look at how ice freezes, there's there's pictures that are identical of a scar on the surface. So if you have a scar on the surface, there's a temperature gradient and then we get a scar from a burn, for example. Adhesions form over time. It's like a slow forming scar throughout the layers of fascia all the way to the bone. So we spiral down and it's these adhesions that are formed to stop us tipping off balance. Gil Headley, he's an anatomist. Um, he has a video that from 2007 maybe called the fuzz speech, which was amazing because he through cadavers really goes in and he talks about the adhesions, which he calls the fuzz. And then I actually did an interview with him about a year ago. So since then, he's been, of course, diving deeper, 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 because there was all these different definitions of fascia. And I always had a very different vision of it, because I can see with my fingers, and I can see the spirals in the body, and I'm undoing those, melting those with my fingertips. So he starts talking about how he continues to go through this infinite layering of the fascia. So he said, there's actually another um, uh, layer of fascia he calls the perifascia. And when he started explaining that, I said, that's what we're addressing with fascia decompression is the perifascia, literally the interconnection of all cells and what we need to do to keep the space. So think of blowing up a balloon. If you blow that balloon up fully, it almost defies gravity. 
it's it glows there's no wrinkles take half of the air out now it's wrinkled it becomes denser it falls to the ground so when we have optimal space and full conscious breath we're able to keep those cells nice and buoyant so that there's again ease of transfer of nutrients in and removal of waste and as long as there's flow there's no pain signal because there's no challenge or stress it's as soon as that cell becomes compromised and there's less space now there's challenge there's um there's a backup it's like you know you're you're driving and it, it's a sunday and there's no traffic and you have no issue driving compared to driving in a traffic jam and now there's exhaust and there's pollution and you can't move as you want to there's all of these adhesions or stagnancies being created because of that um lack of flow so as long as there's flow there's ease in the body as soon as we have a lack of flow there's dis-ease in the body so we can bring that body back to ease of flow through again releasing those adhesions and pulling those cells back to correct alignment okay so before we get into a couple of questions have you heard of either one of you heard of veda austin no she's no. the lady that started to do structured water and she started to take pictures of structured water in petri dishes above the pictures and the structured water remembered the pictures and it was shown in her frozen samples fascinating insane if you guys can look into her and it's part of the alpha vedic podcast with mike winner and uh, dr baird landro they're pretty intense into all this stuff that you guys all of us are getting into i really high, highly recommend them and just wanted to throw that in there and i'll let doc take over with the questions thank you thank you for sharing yep Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, there's one more question. Um, will the techniques be applicable to cats as well, not just dogs? So I think you guys kind of answered that, but he he showed up a little bit late. Yeah, 100%. Um, any animal, you can do guinea pigs, you can do cats. Uh, you will just simply modify your technique to the animal's personality and their willingness to allow you to do whatever you're trying to do to them. Smaller animals in our course, we can we demonstrate how to, that when, when they're little, you can hold them up and do different manipulations. You know, 150 pound dog or hundred pound dog, you may not be able to do that. So we have modified techniques, but absolutely you can work on all the species. Okay, hey, raw, you, you guys talk about raw food. Um, I got into wet food. And I was buying that, I forget the name, something, whatever. It was wet food, but it was organic and it was the best I could find. You talk about raw food. What do you mean with raw food in comparison to for dogs and cats? So a species appropriate diet is the diet that a species would eat if we didn't interfere. So a species appropriate diet for a dog and a cat, they are carnivores. So they were literally designed to eat whatever they killed in the state that they killed it in. So they right. ate the meat, the fat, the bone, and the organ meat, and part of the intestines to replenish their microbiome. So we're trying to simulate that as much as possible. And it's really hard to find a good raw company out there because if they, if it is a raw diet, a lot of the meats are genetically modified because it's cost more, they're cutting corners. And so they're using the, the scrap and the waste material from a lot of companies that have GMO foods. So I literally had to go out and create my own diet because I couldn't get anybody who was willing to manufacture to the standards that we needed. So I created the meat, fat, bone, and organ meat as my macronutrients. And then I separated the micronutrients or the essential nutrients as supplements. You know, certainly we know that that cow and chicken that are going to be in the diet are going to have some nutrients in there. We just can't quantitate how much because we can't tell what kind of soil was growing the landscape that they were eating on. So in the pet food manufacturing business, if you sell a diet and it's complete and balanced, you have to add the essential vitamins and minerals and fatty acids and aminos into the diet. Well, they're going to be synthetic because they won't stand up to the, the uh, processing and the time that it's all blended together. It's not self shelf stable. So I went the opposite direction and I separated my macronutrients from my micronutrients. So we have our pet owners buy the meat, fat, bone, and organ meat looks like a, a hamburger patty. 
and that's in the proper proportion and it's raw. It, it means it's the food that we have has gone through USDA inspection. It's from a USDA inspected facility. So when it leaves that facility, there has been a USDA inspection for no pathogens, no E. coli, no listeria, and no salmonella. And then it's flash frozen immediately after being processed. All grass fed, grass finished animals, humanely processed, so they're not frightened. And then separate from that are the, the micronutrients. So we have a vitamin mineral, which are essential, a plant-based fatty acid. So it doesn't have the rancidity problems and the mercury problems, which by the way, just the heavy metal issues in animals is outstanding. We test for that in all of our patients and we'll find on average three to five significant levels of heavy metals, usually mercury, strontium, cadmium, arsenic, lead. It's crazy what we're finding in these animals. Part of it's from the water, part of it's from the diet. So really, really important as we're looking at the overall health that we we see the animal as a bioregulatory system, right? What is the underlying root causes? It's deficiency, toxicity, and mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay, I've got a doctor who they he loves his cat. And we've got a couple of meat um, dispensers here in town. So what would be the ratio to meat, bone, and fat that you would recommend? Because we've got some, you know, good meat distributors here in town. Yeah, contact me separately and, you know, I can give you some ideas, uh, but there there are variations in there. And, and then, of course, the micronutrients as well and the probiotics and, you know, trying to get all that balanced. But the organ meat is probably the hardest part to get because a lot of processors after COVID, they don't want to handle... Uh, they call it awful, <laughs> O-F-F-E-L. They don't want to handle that because of the USDA. Uh, that if there's going to be contamination with salmonella and E. coli, it's usually from those those um, organ meats. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I don't I don't see any other questions, Doc. Do you? Oh, here's another one. Do you think heavy metal poisoning exposure in cats can come from the uh, wet food cans? 100%. Yeah, it's not just the can because those are aluminum cans, but it's also what's going in the can. So if it's a fish-based product, there's a great likelihood there's going to be mercury problems in there. Um, but we, you know, we see the ones we test for, there's eight, but we see really high levels of arsenic, lead, cadmium, um, uh, strontium, mercury, and lead. Those are really, really pervasive. So when we're looking at chronic disease, it's really important to identify the root cause. And it's always gonna be a deficiency. We find 85%, this is a university study, 85% of animals that were fed a canned or processed diet, canned or kibble diet, 85% were vitamin D deficient. And that's because carnivores don't process vitamin D from the sun, they process it from their protein. So if the protein going into that can was vitamin D deficient, those herbivores process vitamin D from the sun. <laughs> so if that cow or a chicken or what, that, whatever that protein source didn't see daylight, if they were all from feedlots or, or they can call it grass fed, if they were on a pasture for one day of their life, you know, it's very mislabeled, but that's what they can do. So we go grass fed, grass finished. Um, then that animal is going to be vitamin D deficient. And then whatever's eating that animal is going to be vitamin D deficient. And we know that the vitamin D and magnesium literally make the innate immune system. So now you've just lost your whole entire innate immune system because we see a lot of magnesium deficiencies as well. Wow. Okay. There's another question with Shell. Um, great question, actually. What about human food? You know, a lot of us like to like give a leftover piece of steak or a leftover piece of this or whatever. Is it okay? You know, I don't eat ice cream, just saying. <laughs> But, you know, so we a, use it, it depends on what you're eating. You know, right. that's really a big factor. But the okay. other component that, you know, they, they're carnivores. They were designed to eat another animal in the state that they killed it in. They didn't go out grazing in corn pastures. They didn't go out digging up potatoes. So that wasn't their natural diet. If they were starving, they would have gone through man's garbage and they would have chewed on things if they were starving, but that's not their innate diet. And the second thing is that they don't have enzymes in their saliva. They don't have a way to digest carbohydrates in their mouth. They don't have amylase in their saliva. So when we're giving them carbohydrates in their diet, which all processed foods is 40 to 60% carbohydrate sugar. 
So can imagine the inflammation that we're causing just from that. Don't even add anything else in, right? That's horrific. Mm -hmm. And so they they need to be able to um, to digest and not use their pancreas for all of the digestion. So in living food, there's natural enzymes. So when you're feeding an animal a raw diet, then there's still living enzymes in that food to help in the digestion of that diet. But when you cook it, now you've destroyed the enzymes. Now, the only thing that animal can digest with is the pancreas. And over time, we see, of course, the pancreatic diseases that occur because it's just a finite organ. It can only produce so much. And then they have problems with digestion and breaking down their food because they don't have enough um, of the proteolytic enzymes to be able to digest over time. Okay, um, two comments, care of teeth recommendations and can we give digestive enzymes to the pets? Yes, you can give digestive enzymes and everything that we talk about, including periodontal disease and tartar is caused from inflammation. So if we can reduce the inflammation, then we reduce the onset of all of these prolific diseases from skin disease, periodontal disease, all the itises is simply controlled by inflammation. So we have a lot of tips and tools that we use to help mitigate inflammation. But the first thing is don't create it <laughs> as much as possible. So the things that we do have control over is diet, water, environmental toxins, the air quality, and our, these are choices that we make. And of course, okay. shampoo conditioners, you know, don't, you got to read labels. And I think that would be my last take home message is if in doubt, if something is good, read the label. And if there are more than two or three ingredients, there's probably going to be a problem. And if you can't pronounce the ingredients, it's guaranteed a problem, right? Because that's just synthetics are what's destroying our bodies. Uh, Deanna mentioned how many toxins have come in. Well, since World War II, 1942, at the end of World War II, and this is a 10-year-old statistic because I had to research this one, there had been over 85,000 synthetic chemicals released into our environment since World War II. And that was now probably 15 years ago. So you can imagine the number of synthetic toxins that are out there are well over 100,000 and they're stored in our fat. So as we're talking about fascia decompression and lymphatic therapy and detoxification, how important that is to be able to keep all of that moving. And, and then these obese animals, because they're eating such high carbs and they're not getting their exercise, then where is all those toxins going? It's right into their fat, which is not innocuous. It's just off gassing the whole time it's in there. So is it a wonder that we're seeing cancer at rates higher than in humans? So it's almost hundred percent of dogs getting cancer. The statistic over five years ago was one out of 1.65. Now it's my number one differential. It's cancer until proven otherwise. Where 40 years ago, when I started practicing, it was one or two cancers a year. And now it's one to five a day, depending on the day. Don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's really bad. They are the canary in our minefield and we just have to start really taking control. And I'm gonna end on my little bandstand, which is that we get to really use our power if we choose to, and that power is in how we spend our dollars. So. I know it's pretty easy to spend our money on Amazon and have it conveniently delivered to our door. However, that is not a company that is doing us any favors. So whether it's Amazon or Whole Foods or companies that make genetically modified ingredients, whatever that is, if we choose to give them our dollars, we're supporting them and we have to make a line in the sand that says, where do I choose? You may only be one, but you're going to influence your friends and your family. And I'm influencing you guys on this recording. And my request is that we all take a moment in our days to think about what are we spending our money on and who are we giving it to? Is it going locally to companies that are really wanting to do the right thing? Or are we spending our money giving it to companies who are harming us and harming our environment? It's pretty simple. Same thing with going out to restaurants. If we go out to a restaurant and we don't demand 
a healthy meal without processed oils, without the seed oils, and and asking for something organic on the menu. If we don't go up to the owners of these companies and say, hey, I would love to have spent my money here, but I can't because I can't eat your food, then they start to become aware of the fact that they're losing revenue. And I'm a capitalist. I have no problem with that. We know we're all here to make money and to thrive and have that cycle of life. That's great. But are we doing it in the honor of our of our mother earth and our fellow human beings and our pets? Are we helping? Or are we harming? And so that's just my personal, <laughs> I don't expect everybody to do that, but if we could make one change each where we do one thing that helps our environment by making a decision on what we use, I think that would be pretty valuable. We got two more questions actually. Um, and I completely agree one a thousand times. Uh, when dogs eat grass, is there a detox regimen for glyphosate? And will chelation therapy work well in pets? Chelation therapy does work well. It's a long-term process like it is for people. When they're eating grass, uh, there's usually a GI upset. Sometimes people think it's a deficiency. I don't know that we really have a total answer, but they definitely have some GI dysbiosis going on. Uh, so if if you, we got glyphosate raining on our heads, so okay, we're not going to get away from it, but, mm -hmm. but we can do things to mitigate it. One of our labs just came out with a test for glyphosate. That's more economical up until now it was really expensive to test for it. Um, but I think just doing things that help to mitigate it. We have a couple of supplements that are wonderful on a regular basis, just helping to decrease the load of toxicity, glyphosate in particular. So there are things out there you don't always have to test. I think there's an easy assumption that it's probably affecting us. And so we just have to be as conscious as we can to eliminate it as much as possible. If you live in a homeowner's organization, then you know petition that they don't spray glyphosate. We just have to make, again, we just have to try to stand up for ourselves and educate and get people aware. What are, what are the supplements that you're using for? One of them is Hinocchial. I, I did work a lot with Dr. Isaac Elias mm -hmm. and he has Pectisol C, which is a modified citrus pectin, which is also a heavy metal binder and an anti-angiogenic and it blocks galactin-3. So it's blocking your primary alarm protein from actually starting at the cellular level. It's blocking a lot of that inflammation. So that's one product we use. He has another product called Hinocchial. I think it comes from uh, Magnolia Bark. And those are wonderful. And then we use some Quicksilver products as well. Okay. Coffee enemas, wonderful. <laughs> Get more glutathione, <laughs> ozone therapy, hyperbaric oxygen, infrared therapy. There's we have long discussions in our pet parent course on how to do detoxification of all six organs of elimination. Which quicksilver, if I may ask? Well, on the dogs, we can use liver sauce and binder, but wow. not on cats, because a lot of his products our citrus uh, because he uses liposomal products and a lot of them have citrus oils in them we can't use them on cats and gotcha. there is some alcohol in his products that's what it's some of his preservatives so you have to be a little careful on the dosing that you don't give them too much of the alcohol even when we do tinctures we try to burn off the alcohol you said you try to burn off the alcohol yeah you could take your product now not with his liposomals because you'll destroy the liposome but in, when we make tinctures and herbals, I'll heat, you know, like a little glass dish and I'll heat underneath right. and just let the alcohol evaporate. And that's Isaac. What was his last name again? I think. Elias, E-L-I-A-Z. Okay. I get, e a, I get emails from him. I, I'm not sure. Oh, what. gosh, he's amazing. He <laughs> is amazing. He actually is the researcher and developer of Pectosol C mm -hmm. and brilliant Okay. What, what do you, where would you begin? You have a sixties um, uh, person's had cats and dogs their whole lives. And they don't only, you know, only use the commercial products and, you know, we're going to tell them, okay, let's, th this is the wrong way to go. Um, you, you can't turn them all, turn, turn them on a dime. But no. how, do you, how do you ease them into it? Well, I started with my pet parent program. Mm -hmm. 
know, if they, if they don't have a, a life-threatening disease going on, then it's a little harder to get them to make the corner. Just like with you guys, you know, when the person comes in and they don't have a crisis, it's a little harder to convince them that they have to make these lifestyle changes. Once they have the crisis, then they're grasping for anything. They like, just give me an answer. I will do it. And they'll do that for their pets as well. But I start with education. And as you guys have seen a couple of times now, I do a lot of case presentations because pictures tell a thousand words. And when they can relate to obesity or osteoarthritis or cancer, because almost always they're going to have something that they can relate to. I we tried to, when I did my Quicksilver study, we were supposed to have one category of animals that were perfectly normal, never had one single ailment that was category number one. Category number two were those animals that had an occasional problem, occasional vomiting, diarrhea, skin disease, whatever, but nothing major, ear infection. And then category three were the chronic degenerative, autoimmune cancers, all those. We had one animal out of 250 that I could put in category one. How sad is that? One. So pet owners will become, they will relate to things in the course. They're going to relate to hearing that diet maybe should be different. They're going to relate to some of the cases that they see. It may just be a, an ear infection or skin disease that they can relate to, but there's something in there that's going to make them go, oh, well, maybe I could do better. And the difference between what people do for themselves and what they will do for their pet, they will always do more for their pet than they will do for themselves because they want their pet to live a longer, healthier life. And if they've had an animal that died of a disease, then they're going to pay a lot more attention. So it's not as hard of a sell to get them to do things for their pets as you would think they are for people. But just even directing them to the same, because we the first module of our course is free. So even just sending them there to where they can get statistics and understanding is a good start. Okay, great. Okay. Anybody else, any other questions? Uh, great as always, Marlene, thank you so much. And and uh, uh, Deanna also, thank you. Uh, I saw Julie waving. Did Julie have a question? Or are you just waving? Okay. <laughs> I don't see you, Julie. Okay, so. Wow, you guys are amazing. It's Julie's iPad right here. Um, we really appreciate oh, inviting us and, and, and allowing us to share our purpose and our passion, which we obviously are overflowing with it. And I, I'm just so honored to work with this amazing woman. It's very inspiring. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And likewise, and thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to us share. It's so exciting and uh to, again to see these changes in these animals so quickly is just so incredibly heartwarming and um you know for for me to have had this opportunity to actually work the way that i did with these pets and just feel the love i don't have animals myself so it was a very new experience for me to you know really be identifying with these animals and to see them just love you back it was it was truly fascinating and um yeah, I just, my, my heart just expanded so much through this process. And I, I can't wait to share this for, for every pet parent, because um, can, can I just share quickly, Dr. Siegel, this one story about your cat oh, when, sure. the first time, because we didn't know if this was going to work with cats. First of all, we'd been working only with the dogs and we're like, you know, cats are a little less uh, compliant. So she's got her cat on her lap and we're taking earlier. Yes. And we're taking her through this process. So about a half an hour in, cats just love echoes loving it she's got her hands like right underneath the cat's rib cage and and just like loving everything and then about an hour after we began we we were done and the cat who dr siegel shared with me was never that affectionate literally rolls over on her lap and hugs her and holds her and she said that was the first time that echo had ever done that and to just witness this in front of my eyes and then to personally experience it with the animals that we were working on was uh was phenomenal and now every time I go outside in my building and I'm communicating with these animals like I'm they're just they're drawn to me too so it's so fun I think I've you know picked up Dr. Siegel's energy around them and <laughs> they're relating now so it was a lovely journey so Echo my 22 year old was a feral cat and we got him literally as an infant his mother was killed and I can't tell you how many times he has bit everybody in our family including me and I'm his favorite person 
And so when Deanna goes, well, we don't have another animal to work on. Why don't we work on Echo? I looked at her and I went, uh, he's going to bite me. And she goes, well, let's just try. We'll see how far we get. And little bit by little bit, he never bit me. He looked at me a couple of times, but he never bit me. And I, I was amazed at his responses. And he actually was a lot more mobile and feeling a lot better and, and moving better. You know, I mean, he's just like all of us. He's starting to get compression and he was starting to have his issues. I do adjust him periodically, but I have to put him under anesthesia to adjust him because he'll bite me <laughs> if I try to do anything to him. So it was pretty awesome to be able to work on him. And he was actually compliant. That was a big aha for both of us. And I'll share one more quickie. Um, he bit me in my arm a few months ago, <laughs> like full out, opened his mouth and nailed me. And we were, Deanna and I were supposed to work a couple of days later. Literally, we were 48 hours into it. And I said, I can't use my hand. So, you know, we're, we'll just talk about something else. And so she had me go and bring my block down and start doing block work on my arm, which was because I was taking modified citrus pectin at triple the dosage and I was lasering it and I was doing ozone soaks and I was doing rectal ozone. I didn't have that much swelling in it, but I was doing a lot to help control that swelling. And so she had me laying on the block and within just a couple of minutes, there was serum oozing out the holes and it didn't really hurt. It was just an odd feeling. And 24 hours later, my arm was normal. So I don't know if anybody's experienced cat bites before. This wasn't just a bite. He had sunk his teeth all the way to his gums in my arm, all four teeth. So it was a horrific bite and I should have been in a hospital. I never went on antibiotics and I was fully normal in four days. And block therapy was part of what I did to help the compression, get rid of a lot of the swelling and stop the adhesions and the strictures and all the inflammation, and then just let it expand and heal. It's remarkable. So, right. well, well, great as always, Dr. Siegel, and uh, we really appreciate you being part of our group. Um, John, you got anything? You you are an on. I mentioned yeah, before. Yeah, oh, thank Joel, you. Joel it, mentioned. Uh, yeah, thank you. To, like, go ahead. Thank you to Deanna and Dr. Siegel. Always fun, always informative. Thank you. Right. Oh, yeah. John, you you were on. I see what they were describing sounded a lot like osteopathic manipulation, didn't it? Doesn't it though? Well, I tell you what, we lectured about thirty-one years ago on this type of thing you're talking about, and we uh, discussed the three elements of the therapeutics and diagnostics of fascia, and one was physical, and that's what you guys covered tonight, and the other two were uh, electromagnetic. That was acupuncture and chemical, which was neural therapy. So if you do all three, neural therapy, acupuncture, and the fascial release, then you kind of get a big bang for your bucks. <laughs> so it works well. And anyway, you covered something that's always been important in our world. Anything with osteopathy has been doing fascia since the 20s, 30s. Love it. And it's a big deal. Okay. Well, again, thank you. I can't thank you both enough. Um, this was really great. And, uh, you, you know, the problem with, uh, you know, putting on a really nice uh, uh, program for us is that we're going to we're going to bother you again to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can do that. Hey, maybe we'll do one where we actually have you bring your own towel and we do an actual physical session for everybody. What do you think, All Deanna? Right. Well, we, we can... I'm in for that anytime. Absolutely. Kind of kind of arrange it i guess that, that <laughs> and then bring your pet it, it'll be bring your pet day oh, and no. <laughs> i would advertise i would advertise for that one i'd get all the other doctors involved that's for sure. <laughs> that might be something really fun we have to think about that then, very try, much so. try and plan that one and then joel let me know what you want to do on veterans and you know whatever i know deanna would be up for that as well sounds good thank you all right well, okay. thank you guys. Thank as you always, so much. Thank you all. Thank you both. And, and uh, uh, George Cruz is your. Uh, you want to introduce him briefly? I'm going to oh, Jorge? Him tomorrow morning. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Jorge is my left hand, my right hand, and everything when it comes to 
my marketing, my branding, and uh, and just helping me to take that message and bring it out to the world. So if any of you guys have any desire to be able to improve your email list or your communication list, he has a program that he's launching that takes all of your communication and puts it on one platform. It's ridiculously inexpensive and it will simplify your lives in a huge, huge way. And that's just one feature is the communication part. So you know how we're getting a lot of emails and we get text messages and you're, especially in the medical industry, we have to be able to keep track of that and document. And in this platform, it tracks everything. And then you can send messages back out. Everything is logged and documented. So good annotation there. And it, it'll replace DocuSign, it'll replace WeTransfer. So it replaces a lot of the ancillary things that we have and social media. All your social media platform is all contained in this as well. So instead of having to log into Facebook, Instagram, and um, and Google reviews are all in the same place. So you don't have to go outside the platform to be able to function. Everything is in one place. So it becomes very labor less intensive. You know, man, you have no idea. George, we just did a training weekend with Dr. Clearfield. And I was the videographer with the, I don't know, the iPhone 13. And I did a, we ought to use the best stuff here. <laughs> it was a 37 minute video and three or f I think it was four hours later, I was 30% upload and retransfer. So I just canceled it. I had no choice. I think I'm doing, I know you can go like 1080, uh, you know, whatever you can go like real high level when you're recording. I think I'm recording too high level. And I'm trying to get these recordings of what Dr. Clearfield's teaching to with his patients. It was a whole weekend of patients and it didn't work. So I'll talk to yeah, you we'll or talk in tomorrow morning, morning, right? And we'll try to figure this out. Okay. Okay. We'll figure it out. So is yeah. it, is all your, all the talks on this forum only medical or would it be something that Jorge could come in and actually do like a marketing piece for you guys. No, we, do, we could do that. We we're, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty much open to, to, you know, anything that's uh, at least family oriented. So, it's... <laughs> Well, you know, everybody has such a great message. And I, what I see is everybody struggling to get that message out in a efficient and economical and sustainable way. And having somebody like Jorge in your background, being able to help that and tracking your analytics that's huge. Like I'm 40 years into business and I never tracked my analytics. This is the first time we're able to actually see is what we're doing working. Mm -hmm. So it's, it really is important in today's age. The power comes from understanding your numbers. And if I may share my, I've had a team um, building for over a decade now, I've got over 20 staff and uh, we started recently working with Jorge when we started with Dr. Siegel and we are so incredibly grateful for what my team has learned from Jorge and how we're able to change our, our direction. And we were doing a lot of things right, but some of those tweaks, they just make all the difference and it was just a game changer, truly. Thank you, Jorge. Okay, Jorge, you got your you got your uh, work cut out for you. <laughs> I, I, I Thank you so much, up. everybody. Thank you so much. I already I already got a heads up that my 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 emails have have some errors in them, so <laughs> I can't, imagine, I can't imagine that happening. But he did it lovingly. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Gonna, it's it's quite all right. It's okay. I'm gonna, throw this, I'm gonna throw this in there just because. Do you deal with controversy? I, I love controversy. Well, good. Okay. You came to the right that's, place. <laughs> <laughs> that's Dr. Clearfield. We got the AMA and the AOA coming down on Dr. Clearfield. So we need we need high level professionalism. Straight we up. Need, we need warriors out there. <laughs> that's all we need. Okay. All right. All right. We're gonna talk um, tomorrow morning, right, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I can't wait. Can we can we get Jorge's uh, contact email in the chat? Sure. Right. sure. I will I will type in my will type my email right there. Thank you, Shell. And everybody's uh every, wow, Jenny, she would love a talk from Jorge. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Great talk. I, I just type it. To... We, we will arrange it. We will arrange it. So we're gonna twist Thank your you. arm, sir. So <laughs> like I said, if you're confident, 
we we asked you back if you're no good at it like i'm no, not real good at household things so they asked me to to help help paint the paint a room i never get asked the second time <laughs> So we got a lot of comments. One was, this was very enlightening and encouraging talk. Thank you so much. The other one was, thanks. Fantastic every time. Thank you so much. Great talk. Would love to talk from Jorge. And we got your information. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, you check out the... Um... The, the web the websites that that are that are linked on here I clicked on it just real quick just to, so I would would keep it in case I lost it and I saw something about nine dollars for the first lesson or something uh, um, it's actually free I yeah did, you should have I mean, a free I just, I just looked at it for 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 a blip so so that's great okay um uh did John go no man still here okay hey uh but and since and since we have all these witnesses and we got into the marketing and orhe and all that stuff uh bill and i have been talking about doing another website different names international type of uh ids so maybe a new website with orhe's help what do you think bill uh absolutely yeah so we'll be in touch yeah. thank you okay yeah, yeah absolutely sure. i I, th I think we're gonna uh retire the aosrd.org and change it to something else i'll talk to you tomorrow Jorge. okay well, no okay. pressure john what about the how's the medical school coming along any everything is uh you, you guys are the most wonderful part of all of this things are happening so just want to keep it going smooth and maybe Orhe can help us with that because we do have to be careful what we say because we could be as controversial as uh, life would allow, so we, <laughs> we we don't want anybody, uh, uh, you know, suicided. So uh, yeah, want right. to be honest yeah. and forward with this stuff. But it's time information get out because we got a few million people that depend upon that truth and like to see the bravery. I see. When's the estimation of the opening of the uh, medical school? One year and ten months. The students will start. Two years after that, that we'll let them loose in the world. And we, when we let them loose, they're going to be prepared with research and how to do research. So that's really our foot in the door if you want to know what the game is. So we try to keep our credibility through research, and we try to go along with the new educational systems they have in medical schools now, which is an emphasis on research. And if we do research, we're going to find out the truth. So that's our game, to tell the truth and do research in the truth. Yeah, everything's good. Okay, great. Anybody else have anything? Shell, you got anything for us? No, not there. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Any comments? Any other questions? Comments? Um, we'll get. Let me let me get unmuted. Um, A four M. You know they want to put together a uh, Zoom type platform where everyone goes under one umbrella and works together. And I think it's a great idea, plus going international. So we're trying to put something together. And uh, I think it's a, a great idea. Okay. Like like uh, Dr. John said, you know, research and tell the truth. And you can't stop that. No. You know, you can't. No. There's no way of stopping that. And everybody wants to learn, you know. I I kind of, I have the theory that Paradigms are like flypaper. They stick to you and they're hard to get rid of. And people need to research and have open minds. So I think that's a great idea. And sharing knowledge is a great idea. And of course, you know, I'm sure that your speakers, we want to put on uh, Dr. Halas's side too. And, and I'm sure that Dr. Farshan wants to have some of them on his side too. Well, we share back and forth. Yeah. yeah, that's the name of the game. Share the speakers and share the knowledge. Hey, and Shell, you, hey, Shell, you and I will be the peacemakers for sure. And we got to get you on Dr. Halas's, uh Zoom group too. Yes. So let us know. Let us know a topic when you're ready. And, okay. you know, we can do that too. Speaking no, of that's wonderful. So next week um, we have Robert Quinn. Um, who I poached from Dr. Halasa, and he's going to be talking about oxandrolone, and it's not what you think, not not what you've heard. It's not hey, Doc, if I may real quick, um, you had checked out last night before we were, you know, finishing the uh, event. 
Dr. Quinn, Dr. Halasa, even Dr. Farshine was there. She all knows about this. And they were talking about the body. And they're talking about, and I brought in Dr. Laurel Langmeyer, possibly sponsoring um, Dr. Halasa's group because he's looking for funding so that people like himself and you guys and, you know, the body can start to save people's lives. So that's in the mix right now. And we're trying to work on that. And I'll let you Anybody know. Anybody doesn't know, why don't you explain what the, the body is? The body's not a body. The body is a... Body is a, a, a PBA. Um, I forget the name of that term. It's a gentleman out of Michigan. He's creating an environment where we don't have to deal with big pharma so he's becoming his own um his own i I forget the name sorry about that uh stefan hartman knows about it uh dr halasa he's more wanting to work with ama because he's trying to bridge that gap and there's probably a you know there's a synchronicity there that has to be worked on but there was a doctor uh, and Shell can let me know, or hopefully I took a picture of it. He was on with Dr. Quinn yesterday. He's in Vegas. He's on the board with the homeopathic medical board. And I'm going to try to link him up with uh, um, who's our medical doctor doc down in Vegas, who does all the uh, the medical board stuff for the Indians. Uh, Dan Royal. Dan Royal. Yeah. So they're trying to go through the, um, the Indians stuff through the different um, association. I, I can't remember, it's PBA. There's some controversy over going through that. So they're not a, they're not a LLC. They're not a PLLC. They're a public something association, public something association. And there's- Is it, some, a, is it a PMA? A PMA? PMA. Private Membership Association. Private Membership Association. Yeah, one of the uh, big wigs with the farms back east and started to do that, and that's how he avoided the, uh, you know, the um, the government. So that's in the process right now. And so I'm supposed to talk to Dr. Quinn, and with all this going on, if we can get all these Zooms, all these groups, and all these doctors, all of you together, with possibly Pam Hopper, with the MAFA, Make America Free Again. She created this Make America Free Again organization to save um, doctors and non-accredited doctors. All these people like yourself, Deanna, okay, who's not actually a doctor, but you're saving people's lives. Big Pharma is even coming after people like you. So Mm -hmm. she's bringing in lawyers to fix that stuff. (laughs) It's people like Dr. Clearfield. So this whole so cut this thing- part out, John, before we we send it off to be be the you know. <laughs> so this is all going on in the background, and we're all working on this, and you know, pray for us. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, That's I want I want to make one more comment. Doctor Quinn is dynamite when it comes to diet and nutrition. Agreed. So my point is, uh, Dr. Siegel can talk about nutrition for pets and dogs and birds and animals, you know. And then, you know, I have my granddaughter going to college in a couple of weeks. So how do we educate young kids on, on good nutrition, lifestyle and diet? And if everyone could chip in, it would be a great book, you know. I'm great happy to contribute. Chapter. But, you know, the the biggest way to teach is by example. Agree. Yeah. It is. So, you know, I, I love my food forest. I'm always sharing. Um, I got to show you the mangoes I picked today. You won't believe the size oh, of the things. This was just one species of mango. <laughs> Can you see the size of that thing? I can't even hold it. I can't even cover it with my hands like amazingness and I have pesto and I, we recycle everything. So I actually take rinds of lemon, lime, and orange, and then I cook them down just the rinds. And then I cook them down into a sugar water, like a syrup and make candied rinds. 
absolutely the best treat ever. And you're getting all the nutrition from the skins and the polyphenols and the salvesterols. And, you know, we're just eating what nature gave us instead of processed foods. You could do a cookbook for people and pets. I could. <laughs> I could. Horry's been over for dinner before. Amazing, right? He and the family, you're muted, Jorge, but he and his kids came through and they were picking cherries and spinach and just, oh my God, the kids had so much fun. <laughs> the flavor is just unique. It's a flavor that you have never, you have never tasted that before. It's, <laughs> it's unique. Yeah, it's unique. We made pestos like out of the garden. It was just amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, anybody who's in Florida, they can come over for dinner. Okay. We'll be there tomorrow <laughs> night. It'll take us a couple days to get there. Absolutely. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, and a great talk. Jorge, I'll be speaking with you tomorrow morning. Um, yeah. Anybody else have any comments or questions before we sign off? It said Dr. Oh, good. Dr. Oh, good. Next, back next week, same time, same station. Anybody has anything that, that they'd like to present, please let me know. And um, if anybody had sent, you know, some of our, our uh, uh, former uh, speakers that would like to have them back, let me know. Right now, we're still at aosrd.org slash webinars. That's where all the all the videos are. Um, lots of most of them have transcripts with them. Some of them have slideshows. Some of them don't. Um, but everything that we've done for the last, you know, uh, October's coming up on three years that we've been doing this. And we've been here every Tuesday, um, I think. Like, except for, we, I took off the 4th of July this year, it was a Tuesday, but we're here every Tuesday. Um, so if you um, need a, you know, wanna, wanna look at some of the old, old other, older, <clears throat> um, uh, so we have quite a library of uh, of uh, uh, content now. So um, so as, as, you remember, as you may recall, we were accused of not having a website. So it's, it's one, one of our sins, so. So <laughs> our website that's not there, that's been there for five years. So so um, thank you all again. Uh, we'll see you again next week. If and Any comments, questions? Um, anything else left, John? Everything's good. Okay. Uh, I will. I'm going to add one thing. Just because uh, Bill says I make creepy videos, but I want Dr. Siegel, Deanna, and Jorge to look at this because it could be part of our uh, show. So anyway, I put it on the chat. Thank you. Bye. I got to I got to slide all the way there before it goes away. I don't see it. I don't see it. John. I don't see oh, it. Really? Boom. There you, go. there you go. That way you can see my creepy video, but I didn't use my my creepy voice. That's, it, you, that. your, you do use yeah. that voice too. <laughs> I used the, I used a nice voice, but it's about a little girl who's wondering about food in her bowl. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll take a look. And okay. she and she, she, uh, she woke up videos that are uh, unique. We'll just leave it at that. Well, you guys tell me. Okay. <laughs> we will. Right, John. Thanks a All lot. Right. Take good night, everybody. The thank end. you. Thank you. Bye. Much. Bye. Thank you, and Jorge. Thank you for being here. Don't be strangers. We're here every week. Thank you. Bye. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.